an important aspect of quality management is process control. Once we have designed a process to behave a certain way, what steps can we take to ensure that the process continues to behave that way? For example, say I have designed my process to produce 99.99995% of my coffee within the temperature range of 150 degrees to 170 degrees. To do this, I have selected coffee machine model C, which is 5 sigma capable. It produces coffee at an average temperature of 160 degrees with a standard deviation of 2 degrees. As long as the process continues to behave the same way, I can be confident that I will be producing only one defect in 2 million. But what if the average temperature changes and is no longer 160 degrees? Or what if the variability of the process changes and the standard deviation is no longer 2 degrees? To ensure that these parameters don't change, I can stand by the machine all day long and take constant measurements. Unfortunately, dedicating myself to my coffee machine in this manner means that I will not be able to accomplish anything else. I need a better method to control my process. I decide instead to take random observations throughout the day to monitor whether my coffee machine is behaving normally. I then track these observations on a chart. I know that these observations are going to vary about the mean. So on this chart, I also plot a band that I consider a normal range of behavior. I call these benchmarks as my upper and lower control limits, UCL and LCL. These benchmarks serve as my alarm settings for catching abnormal behavior. As long as my observations stay within these benchmarks, I assume that my process is behaving normally. I say that the process is in control. This normal amount of variation that I observe is due to expected reasons. That is, it is attributable to common causes of variation. On the other hand, if my observations exceed the bounds of normal behavior, I conclude that the process is out of control. The abnormal variation I observe is due to unexpected reasons. That is, it is attributable to assignable causes of variation. In that case, I need to investigate into what might have happened, look for ways to eliminate the assignable causes, and bring the process back to normalcy. But what amount of variation should I consider as normal variation, and what should I consider abnormal? If I select a narrow band, I increase my chances of catching any process shifts or abnormal behavior. However, even when the process is behaving normally, a large number of observations are likely to fall outside such a narrow band, resulting in false alarms. That kind of false alarm is called a type 1 error. On the other hand, if I select a wider band, I would have a weaker alarm. The process would have to go much more out of whack before I started seeing observations outside the band. A lot of process shifts and abnormal behavior may go unnoticed. That is called a type 2 error. Let us say I set my alarm settings, the UCL and LCL benchmarks, at two standard deviations on either side of the mean. Every time I get an observation outside this band, I switch off the coffee machine, rip it apart, and service it. We know that the mean plus or minus 2 sigma band includes 95.5% of observations. That means even when the process is behaving normally, I still expect to get 4.5% of my observations outside the benchmarks. That means there is a 4.5% chance of my getting alarmed and servicing the machine, only to find out that everything is normal after all. That's a type 1 error. How about I increase the band to mean plus or minus 3 standard deviations? We know that the mean plus or minus 3 sigma band includes 99.75% of observations. That means when the process is behaving normally, I expect to get 0.25% or 1 in 400 of my observations outside the benchmarks. My probability of a false alarm has now reduced from 4.5% to 0.25%. The red point in the corner might be one such false alarm but since there's such a small chance of a false alarm, it is probably indicative of abnormal behavior. 
On the other hand, suppose there is actually something wrong with my coffee machine. Say the knob setting has changed a bit. These observations that I got are actually from a process that is behaving abnormally, but they are still within the benchmarks. So, I will be blissfully unaware that the process is behaving abnormally. That is a type 2 error. It is only when I get to the red point in the corner that I wake up. In going from a mean plus or minus 2 sigma band to a mean plus or minus 3 sigma band, I have reduced my chance of a type 1 error, but increased my chance of a type 2 error. How about I increase the band to mean plus or minus 4 sigma? My probability of a false alarm or type 1 error will reduce to 1 in 2 million. On the other hand, that leaves a lot of room for things to go wrong with my coffee machine. Meanwhile, I will be blissfully unaware that the process is behaving abnormally. The probability of a type 2 error will be extremely high. As we can see here, it does not make much sense to use any alarm settings besides 3 sigma or 2 sigma control limits. To balance the trade-off between type 1 and type 2 errors, we typically settle for a mean plus or minus 3 sigma band. That is, we use 3 sigma control limits. In some circumstances, if we have a process where we are really concerned about the cost of failure, we want to err on the side of caution. In such a situation, we would choose a mean plus or minus 2 sigma band or 2 sigma control limits. Rather than risk a catastrophic failure, we don't mind chasing false alarms 4.5% of the time. An important point to note here is that whether we use 2 sigma or 3 sigma control limits to monitor and control our process, the process itself could be capable at the 3 sigma, 4 sigma, 5 sigma or 6 sigma level. Process capability has to do with meeting the customer's tolerances, in this case 150 degrees to 170 degrees. The farther away these tolerances are from the mean, the better our chances of meeting them. That is, 6 sigma is better than 5 sigma, which is better than 4 sigma, and so on. Meanwhile, process control has to do with the control limits, or the early warning alarm settings. The closer these limits are to the mean, the better our chances of recognizing a problem at the earliest possible time. That is, 2 sigma is a more sensitive alarm than 3 sigma, which is more sensitive than 4 sigma, and so on. However, if the control limits are too close to the mean, such as with 2 sigma limits, we could be running in circles chasing false alarms. When monitoring my process, it is often not feasible for me to measure every single cup of coffee. Rather, I'm going to use a sample of observations to provide me information about what may truly be happening with the process. One of the benefits of sampling is that I can use a fraction of the effort that it would take to measure the entire population and yet get an adequately accurate picture. In general, the larger my samples and the more frequently they are taken, the more accurate the picture. Another important reason for sampling is as follows. To control my coffee machine process, I made the assumption that the temperature observations followed a normal distribution. Thus, I was able to apply the statistical properties of the normal distribution to figure out normal versus abnormal behavior. Instead, what if I have a measurement that follows a really weird distribution? In this case, I certainly cannot apply the properties of the normal distribution. But if I cannot apply the properties of the normal distribution, what sense can I make about this process? And how can I control it? In such a situation, sampling comes to the rescue. Say I take a sample of 10 observations and calculate the sample mean. Then I take another sample and another one and so on. If I plot all these sample means, the distribution of the sample means will look a little bit more bell-shaped than the original weird distribution. Suppose I increased my sample size to 20 observations. The distribution of the sample means will look quite a lot like the normal distribution. Suppose I increase my sample size further to 30 observations. No matter how weird the underlying distribution, with a sample size of 30 observations, the distribution of the sample means is almost guaranteed to follow the normal distribution, except as you go farther into the tails. With most measurements, though, 
that have a less weird distribution, you can settle for a sample size much smaller than 30.